Hey guys, what's up? So, welcome back to a, another discussion video today. So, with this one, I'm just going to talk about the San Diego Comic Con Live at Home event that happened on 22nd, 26th of July. The reason I'm doing a video on this is because I've been seeing a lot of like commentary YouTubers uh, and just like articles online talking about how much of a bust it was. And I just thought, you know what, I'm an, I'm a veteran convention goer, so I thought, oh, actually, I can talk about this and I can kind of weigh up how I thought it was. So I'm just going to be looking at a article from Variety because uh, that's where a lot of the information is in terms of the figures and stats. So we'll just go over it and I'll just give my opinion on the event as a whole. So this article here it says why Comic at Home at Home was a bust. Okay. Alright, so it just reads if a fan convention is held on the internet and no one's here to talk about it, does it make any noise? Okay. There was the overall whelming experience of Comic Con Home, the virtual fan convention that ran from July twenty second to twenty sixth. It was meant to replace San Diego Comic Con, the massive annual fan gathering that was forced to cancel due to the COVID nineteen pandemic, so this was like an alternative. Despite Ada's panels for The Walking Dead, I actually saw them, they were really good. Uh, Star Trek Universe and two Comic Con release movies, Comic Con at Home cast a power shadow in comparison to Comic Con in recent years. Perhaps a stark example yet of what we lose when we lose the live experience. No, I'll keep going, I'll give my opinion on it. According to the data from social media, analytics from Listen First, tweets that mention Comic Con at Home were down 95% from 2019's live convention. Damn. I mean, it's not really surprising, is it? Let's be honest. Just 93,681 tweets over the five-day event against 1,719,000 tweets in 2019. Well, I mean, that, that that is a ridiculous number, but I can understand why it dropped. We'll keep going. Tweets about the top 10 TV events were similarly down 93%, and tweets about the top five movie panels were down a shocking 99%. I mean, that is... That's a massive drop in interest. Views on YouTube, which hosted the most, the vast majority of Comic Con's panels, were scarcely better. Average views of Thursday, which have had the longest period for people to watch them, are hovering around fifteen thousand per panel. Okay. On the one hand, that's over double the capacity of for Comic Con's biggest live venue, the famed Hall H. Yeah, because I think Hall H is only like what six thousand people, so pretty much double that. But again, I can kind of see where they're coming from. In terms of YouTube views and social media impact, by far the best performing panel for Comic at Home was the New Mutants, 20th Century Fox long suffering Marvel Comics adaptation, which had had its release date pushed four times since April 2018. Yeah, like that film has got moved so many times, man. I think it even got to a point where we were like, is this actually going to happen? To date, the film's panel has logged just over 208,000 views on YouTube since July 23rd, thanks largely to the decision to debut a first look at the opening scene for the film within the panel itself. And it was the most discussed movie panel on Twitter, generating 7,700 tweets. I do remember it seeing like a lot of attention. I haven't actually watched it yet, so I can't comment. But I remember seeing it was like a trending topic, so yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Still, success series relative, the 52nd app promoted the Comic Con home panel for the new mutants logged over 303,000 views in 11 days. Okay, that's not bad. Retrospective panel for history's recently concluded series of Vikings entitled Vikings Look Back with the Lothbrooks performed a bit better on YouTube with over 218,000 views. Its social impact, however, was much more muted with 1,230 tweets during the virtual convention. Mm, mm, yeah, okay. It's, I mean, the numbers aren't great, really. Uh, then it goes on, the panel for MC is The Walking Dead, which included the announcement that season 11 will be delayed due to the pandemic, was the strongest performance for TV, logging up 84,000 views on YouTube and generating nearly 11,900 tweets. Panels for spin-off shows Fear The Walking Dead and The Walking Dead Well Beyond didn't fare quite as well, earning just over 66,000 views and 21,000 views respectively. More importantly, none of the pre-recorded Walking Dead panels, indeed, none of the Comic-Con at home panels at all, included any kind of fan interaction, the most elemental reason for Comic-Con's 50-year success. Even the comment sections have been turned off for Comic-Con at home YouTube panels. And that thing is, with the Walking Dead one, I kind of really enjoyed them, because um, I didn't tune into a lot of it, because I was just, like, busy doing other bits. But I remember watching the Walking Dead one, like the main Walking Dead panel, that was really enjoyable because they had like two sets of actors um, and Chris Harvick hosted it who does the Talking Dead and he he's always fun when he does it but yeah, I really enjoyed that one because uh, it, it gave us a bit more insight into like the long awaited season 10 finale which is coming October the 4th 
and uh, there's also an extra six episodes of season 10 so there was a lot of information I enjoyed it Fear the Walking Dead I haven't caught up on but I still watched it because like it's a really good cast and like obviously Lenny James is in Fear now so obviously I like him as Morgan and The Walking Dead will be on because it's quite new I suppose people haven't really connected with it and there's not been a lot of information on it apart from like a teaser trailer um, so I can get why Fear and World Beyond weren't as high as The Walking Dead. I, I still really enjoy The Walking Dead ones. I thought it was really entertaining. There was a lot of information. Yeah, in terms of obviously the fan interaction, with these virtual powers, it's, we're not going to have that per se. Because um, obviously when you're there, you get to ask the actors questions and stuff. I, just, I mean, if they'd have done it maybe on Twitch, I suppose they could have had the chat box, but I guess they had to pre-record a lot of the panels just to try and get all the actors available so I can kind of see no fan interaction in that aspect so I can understand that fans can talk with creators says listen first chief marketing officer Tracy David it really defeated interest around the comic on home experiment lack of panels on Marvel Studios Lucasfilm and DC films events which have become virtually synonymous with comic Con certainly didn't help boost overall interest in comic Con at home but there was also several strange missed opportunities to generate the kind of promotional buzz that built Comic Con to an essential pop culture event. The only major Marvel panel at Comic Con at home for the Disney Plus docuseries Marvel 616 on the history of the company included two clips from the show that had already been released on YouTube the day before. Similarly, the new release of Bill and Ted's Face the Music, which will now open on premium video on demand and in select theaters on September 1st, was announced two days before its splashy panel on Saturday. Yeah, I think. I think that was a factor as well because obviously every year at San Diego we get we get all the Marvel announcements, we get DC, um, so I feel like, and obviously we get Star Wars announcements, so I feel like them not being there maybe didn't generate as much interest and because some of the stuff got shown a few days before, again, they probably should have waited, but I suppose not having those big studios there, it, it does take traffic away from the event, so I can understand that. And the massive Star Trek Universe panel spent 20 minutes on a live reading of the teaser first out of the season 2 finale for Star Trek Discovery. But found no time to announce genuine news that the show's third season will premiere on October 15th. Instead, that was done on Monday by a press release. Okay. Oh, what was there? Uh, Comic Con at Home didn't even generate the buzziest fan event of the weekend. On Saturday, director Zack Snyder appeared on the independent fan convention Justice Con to debut a short clip from his upcoming Snyder Cut of the Justice League. They revealed Superman's black suit. Notably, the panel, which logged over 260,000 views in less than 48 hours, was live, allowing Snyder to spend an hour interacting with the very fans who brought about the Snyder Cut in the first place. I, I did watch Justice Con, and it was like, it was a fan organised virtual con. And the three girls that had done it, like it was, it was really enjoyable. I only call uh, Ray Fisher's panel, like they had a cyborg panel. I called that. That was really cool because he's he's quite a, like an intellectual and fun guy, and he does a lot of Twitch streaming as well. And I remember Zack Snyder hopped into that one, and that was like, well, okay, this is cool. And then I actually watched the Zack Snyder live uh, stream, and they showed the clip with Superman in the black suit, and I was like. Oh, okay, Mr. Snyder, you've got me interested now. Okay, and that was really cool, that because it was like it was done by fans for fans, and the fact that some of these actors at the time had to jump in on these streams it was cool, and because it was live, they'd done it on Twitch, I think, and obviously fans could ask questions as well. So, getting more of a fan experience than what San Diego did. So that was a really cool event. Now I'm gonna tune into that next year. But yeah, I think not having not having any DC stuff, especially for the Snyder Cut at San Diego, that I think that hurt it a bit, and I think Justice Con has done better in numbers as well, so it, it depends how they organise it, it can have a factor. In fairness, just with, with just a few months repair, the fact that Comic Con at home happened at all is a remarkable feat, and its organisers certainly tried to bring some measure of the Comic Con experience to fans' computer screens. One of the core events of the convention, the annual Masquerade Ball, where hardcore cosplayers can showcase their lavishly creative costumes, move to its natural online habitat, Tumblr, and organise to create an interactive map of the vast convention floor with links to exhibitors who have used the convention for decades as a vital revenue stream. But a cold list of links in the hollow surrogate for the sensory overload of the Comic Con floor, with thousands of convention goers streaming past everything from elaborate displays of Superman and Batman costumes to unassuming kiosks for independent comic publishers. 
If you can't wander around the San Diego Convention Centre, counting the number of Princess Leia's Black Panthers and Wonder Woman's you see in a day, is it ever even really Comic Con? Over the past five months, the entertainment industry has struggled with how to replicate live events or in the virtual space, but if Comic Con at home achieved anything, it was revealing the abiding truth that there is no substitute for the live experience. Hmm. Okay, right. Let's narrow it down. The thing is with Comic Con, I've never done San Diego. I, I go to obviously all the big ones are in London. So I've never done San Diego or love to. But based on the convention I've gone to, part of it is it's being there. It's so fun the atmosphere, you know, meeting fellow like fans or the cosplayers, meeting the actors, going to the panels because you soak up off the experience and the atmosphere of what act the actors are saying at the panels and just you just get lost in like in the environment. So naturally a an online event is not gonna it's not gonna really create that buzz and that atmosphere. It's just going into this thinking it would achieve the same, I think you'd be solely disappointed because you can't replace the live event, you just can't. Like I'm glad they've done these these virtual cons because it's still giving us that convention experience, but it's not the same as like being there. Like not the same as like you said, meeting other people, talking to other fans, seeing all the cosplays, going to the vendors, going to the panels, meeting the actors, getting your photo ops and your autographs. It just it won't it won't be the same. I mean, and I think with the San Diego one in particular, it was kind of thrown together in a very short amount of time. So I think it showed a little bit. Don't get it wrong, it was cool that they threw it together. Because if I'm right, at San Diego, there's like, what, two, three hundred different panels? It was good they'd done the four-day event. I only called, I think it was the Saturday when I watched all the Walking Dead stuff. Because, to be honest, I just forgot it was on. So I can understand the comments and the figures, how it's not generating as much buzz. Because I think when you're there, obviously, you're going to be... People go straight on social media. And when they do, like, a live reveal at a panel at Holt H, you go straight on Twitter. And people are going to trend in Twitter and tweet it. I can't speak. Yeah, so when something gets unveiled at San Diego straight on Twitter or any social media, it starts trending and it generates buzz, then people retweet or they'll put a hashtag in a tweet. So not being there, it, it, it does it doesn't generate the same buzz. Um it was cool that they tried to put something together. I think if they did that through Twitch maybe maybe might have got a bit more attraction. Because like when WoW's Comic Con that they done it through Twitch. And I think Justice Comms done to Twitch as well. So at least you've got the online chat box and you can interact and ask questions and stuff. So maybe that's something San Diego should have looked into. I'm not knocking them because it's probably taken so much work to get that organised. And I suppose with the kind of calibre of actors, they couldn't do it live because it's a scheduling thing. I know, obviously at the moment, the world's on standstill. But I suppose if they had other commitments, they had to do it pre-recorded, whereas Justice Con was live. I think the Justice Con module worked really well and it gained a lot more views and traction. The virtual cons are gonna be thing of the present for I don't know how long because the pandemic is it's not it's not gonna end anytime soon. It'll be interesting to see how DC fandom handled theirs this month, because obviously we've got that on the twenty second of August, so I'll be interested to see how they handled it. I get the, the negativity for San Diego at home. Let, let's be honest, you cannot replace the live event. You cannot replicate being at Comic-Con. It's just, like, it's an exhausting three, four, five days, however long it is. When you come back, you feel, like, so refreshed and, like, the passion comes back for all the things. Like, I find that, like, if I've been having a bad time and I know I've got a convention coming up, as soon as I get there, switch off, forget all the bad stuff. And it's like, it's like a home away from home, if you like. Like, I love Comic-Con, like, people say to me, oh, you go too much, or he's on the same, it's like, well, yeah, but you go to the pub all the time, or you go to a football game, like, let me be me, let me do me, you do you. I just love being in Comic-Con, because it, it, to me, it, it's like you're surrounded by people that love the same thing you do, it is a home away from home, and I've had so many awesome memories at Comic-Con, like, where it's been London Film Comic-Con, where it's been MCM, where it's been Heroes and Villains, like, all the planning and preparation, you have memories for a lifetime, and... The virtual events can't replace that and they never will replace that. That being said, I think them doing these virtual events is still a cool thing. And I, I enjoyed the Walking Dead ones I watched. Justice Con was great as well because I love DC. So it's cool that they've got that. I am looking forward to DC fandom because I know from what Zack Snyder said in Justice Con, there's going to be a lot of reveals for his just cut Justice League. I imagine the Arrowverse shows, we may see some stuff. I think may see a trailer for season 7 of The Flash because I think that's probably the only show that maybe might have have something to show. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, you know, you can't you can't replace the live event. I, I enjoyed it. I can understand why it's deemed a failure, if you like, when you look at the numbers. But again, 
should you really be surprised? Like a virtual event is not going to replace a live event. So obviously naturally the numbers aren't going to be as big. And if it's not been marketed properly or advertised, it's not going to generate the numbers, is it? I get to a lot of people, it's a failure. Me personally, they did the best they could. You know, I enjoyed the Walking Dead panels. I enjoyed the boys panel. That was pretty cool. It's not going to replicate the live event. So I think maybe if they have to do it, another virtual one next year because even though events are getting rescheduled let's face it this pandemic is changing on a daily basis we don't know i mean we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow so let know in a year's time i'm intrigued to see how dc fandom do it see if it's going to be different to san diego at home which you'll see be just see what you guys think in the comments down below to summarize my opinion is you can't replicate the live experience and atmosphere of being a comic con this was a good substitute i get the criticism with the state of the world that's the closest thing we're going to get to comic con that's that's just facts it. Be interested to see what you guys think. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe down below. Stay tuned for more videos, and I shall catch you guys on the next video. Have a good day, guys, and I'll catch you then.